Okay, hi everyone, happy Friday. So let's start talking about the big topic that was on a lot of your minds in the last lecture. Now a little review. So what we have here is blood glucose or commonly called blood sugar, but glucose is the typical sugar they're referring to with blood sugar. So what's the normal range we're using for this class? We are using this magic, these two magic numbers. So between 70 and 110. Again, some different unit institutions, they might have a different cutoffs for these values. But for this class, let's keep it the same because it's consistent between our books. But again, if you're going to like another country or if you're going to another research institution or somewhere else, they might have different values. Now, hyperglycemia for this class, let's define it as this. The hyper, again, is like a, I mean, think someone's hyperactive, that means they're overactive, they're full of energy. But hyper, in this case, referring to glucose. So they have above normal levels of glucose. So this is like sometimes just called high blood sugar, but that's what's referring to hyper, above, and then sugar for glycemia. So what we have here is like a, for this class, we'll define it as a fasting blood glucose concentration over 110 mg per deciliter. And then hypoglycemia, so hypo is the opposite of hyper, meaning below or under. So if it's below the low normal range, the normal range minimum, we consider that low blood sugar. And again, this might dif differentiate, or not differentiate, but this might differ between their different textbooks, countries, health institutions, but for this class, these will be our cutoffs. Now, if you saw that previous one, like look at this person taking their blood sugar, and what we see, oh man, they are super hyperglycemic. I mean, if our cutoff is 110, they're more than twice our cutoff using these values. Now, this is like something I got from a diabetes group, and they said put blood into blood glucose monitor meter, 28 mg per deciliter. I was like, whoa, that is like super hypoglycemic, and I'm actually surprised if their blood sugar is that low that they're still conscious. Now, how low is too low? Like, when are you in danger, like Ralph there? Well, this is the plasma glucose level, and how, okay, how much, what's the concentration of glucose in your blood? Now actually, like our, if we're using the 110 over 70 cutoff right here, the, you actually don't get symptoms until you're a little below that limit. So you might be feeling fine, but you're technically hypoglycemic, but you want to intervene before you start getting the symptoms. And you notice that if you, your blood glucose drip dips lower and lower and lower, you can end up like decreased cognition, so trouble thinking, aberrant behavior, so your behavior is not as usual, and seizure or coma, so if your blood sugar is all the way down there, you may already be unconscious. And over here, brain death, so this is where you don't want to be. You don't want to be in this range, so that's why different institutes have different ranges for hypoglycemia. The main thing is that you want to be able to intervene before you end up in like not unable to intervene and unconscious like you see with the really low levels of blood sugar here. Now what's one way you can do that? Well, sometimes this is why some people might have a glucagon in reserve over here. And what you have is over here with the glucagon is a peptide hormone and it's produced and released by those pancreatic alpha cells. And what it does again to review from last lecture is that it frees your energy reserves and what it does is like, okay your body stores energy stores your, its macronutrients and like triglycerides pet, and also you have your protein reserves and in your body and you also have your glycogen reserves as well so what is it going to do it's going to break down all these reserves and release these nutrients into your bloodstream including glucose and it's also going to stimulate that process of gluconeogenesis in generating new glucose and insulin to review is another peptide hormone that pretty much does the opposite of glucagon. It's released instead of by alpha cells, it's released by beta cells. And instead of like freeing up more glucose in your body, it's going to shunt the glucose into your cells and feed your cells. So by moving glucose from your blood into your cells, it actually lowers your blood sugar. And insulin effect, so again, what's it going to do? Because it's feeding your cells by moving sugar from the bloodstream into your cells, it's going to cause your cells to use that glucose and increase its energy production. And if there's too much glucose and your cells can't use up the glucose quickly enough, then they might store it as glycogen. 
and then you're also going to have increased so it's not only just feeding glucose but the thing about this is why insulin is anabolic because it also promotes protein synthesis as well and if you have too much glucose not only can it for and carbohydrates and nutrients not only can it just form glycogen it can also form fat fatty acids and triglycerides as well now we did to recover or to review the basic insulin mechanism I want you to know for this class. So again, we have all this glucose in the bloodstream, and then when our beta cells are going to secrete that hormone, insulin. Insulin binds to its receptor on cells, and that triggers cell signal transduction. Again, signal transduction is very complex, but I just want you to know that. When insulin binds to its receptors, what does it do to glucose transporters? It tells glucose transporters, which are held within the cell when it's not active, well, if you have insulin binding to its receptor, these transporters are going to move to the surface of a cell. And with glucose transporters, now where glucose is in the bloodstream or in extracellular fluid, now glucose transporters can bring in glucose and your cells get fed with new glucose. And again, this is insulin signaling. And I don't expect you to know that. Like that part right there, what signal transduction? Everything that happens here. So I don't expect you to know that part, but that previous cartoon I showed you, yeah, that's what I want you to know. Now, what we have with insulin blood glucose, again, insulin binding to receptor, and glucose transporters appear, and this is why your blood sugar could become lowers when you have insulin. Because why? With these glucose transporters there, it's going to move glucose from the bloodstream into your cells, thereby lowering your blood sugar. Okay, now let's go to top hat. And there's no attendance for this class. Like we only take attendance in the first week and that's it. Okay, so let's do a little survey. And again, this is not just like a, there's no right answer for this one. <laughs> All right, let's see the responses. And it seems like actually the majority of us know, either has diabetes or we know someone with diabetes. Next question. Again, this is, I'm not going to ask you stats like this on the test, but let's see if you can make a good guess. So in 2014, how many Americans, and you have to type in the answer, were living with diagnosed, so they were diagnosed with diabetes, or undiagnosed, meaning they have diabetes, but they didn't go to a doctor and they don't know they have diabetes. See the most common responses? Ooh, that's a big wide range. But the actual correct answer is between this. So we see like, oh wow, that's a lot, right? So almost like, around the order of 30 million people in the US back then were living with diabetes mellitus. And in 2010, and I don't know if they have more recent st statistics, but how many people in Hawaii do you think were living with diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes mellitus? So the population of Hawaii back in 2010 was around 1 million people. And we're talking about the entire Hawaiian islands, not just over the big island. Okay, let's see the responses. So we have a pretty wide range, and what's the correct answer? Well, the correct answer is around 100,000, so about one-tenth of the population back then. All right, so why is diabetes mellitus important? Because it affects so many people. It affects millions of Americans, and also affects hundreds of, yeah, ten, or probably now like, well, maybe not hundreds of thousands, but around like 100,000 of us here in Hawaii, right? So around 10%, so one out of 10 people are Americans are living with diabetes mellitus. And the, for comparison's sake, and this is why I'm not using just millions, I'm just trying to show you how big that number is. So this is why it's a big concern. And the Texas, for comparison's sake, the population of Texas is around 21, 29 million, right? So imagine like if you could give all the diabetes to just Texas, we'd still have enough diabetes to go on to other states as well. So that's just showing you how much, how big of a problem diabetes mellitus is in America. Now, there's around 1.5 million new cases in the US every year, and our current population in the Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands is around two, just under 1.5. 5 million. So this is like if this is like the entire population of Hawaii getting diabetes every year. That's what we have a problem with that diabetes mellitus in the United States. That's the seventh leading cause of death in the United States and it's a little tricky because it's like 
Okay, well, diabetes often goes hand in hand, hand in hand with other diseases as well, especially cardiovascular disease, which is the number one leading cause of death in America. So diabetes mellitus is important because it affects so many people, but it also is a it also kills a lot of people as well, whether directly or indirectly as well. Now, what is diabetes mellitus? Or often, just people when people are talking about diabetes, they're typically talking about diabetes mellitus. Now, and you might have seen all the memes and whatnot. So, like, or if you say, "Oh, if you eat too much sugar, what are you going to get? You're going to get diabetes." But is that necessarily true? Well, diabetes mellitus refers to well, the two main types are type one diabetes mellitus and type two diabetes mellitus. So type 1 diabetes, and there's multiple ways of abbreviating this, but this is the one I tried to use for this class, but other abbreviations and names might have, it might appear in like other textbooks and other classes as well. It's also called insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or IDDM. Now it was previously called juvenile diabetes because it tended to appear in people who are younger, but this fit term has fallen out of favor because people who are adults, they can develop type 1 diabetes mellitus later on in life. But if you look at older papers, they might say juvenile diabetes, so they're referring to this type of diabetes mellitus. Because why? Well, this is the definition. It's insulin dependent. Now, type 2 diabetes mellitus, what it is is very creative, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. So it's related, but instead of being dependent on insulin, now it's non-insulin dependent. And this non-insulin dependence means that insulin is there, but now the cells in the body are not responding normally to insulin. So this phenomenon is called insulin resistance. So it's not about just like eating a lot of sugar, but it's about how your body, or when, if your body is making insulin, or if it's, and or if it's responding properly to insulin. Now there are other types of diabetes as well, and gestational but diabetes is related to type 2 diabetes, but it's specific in context. So it's referring to during pregnancy if someone becomes insulin resistant, or sometimes they have a lack of insulin as well. And there's also like, like hormones that are made by the placenta that makes the body more resistant to insulin. So it's a specific to pregnancy and hormonal changes, like many hormonal changes occur during pregnancy, but this is also something that can develop. But once it's, the pregnancy is over, hopefully it comes back to normal. So diabetes mellitus is also different from a different type of diabetes called diabetes insipidus or DI. So they're not the same thing. They share some common symptoms, but the way they are caused is totally different or, or like, yeah, they're, to they're totally different mechanisms. So instead of being involving insulin, it's involving ADH or vasopressin, that water balance hormone we we're talking about. But we'll talk if we do have time for it, because usually I run out of time before I have to, I can actually talk about this. We'll talk postpone diabetes insipidus to later on if we talk about that with the kidneys and fluid balance as well. All right, so what is type 1 diabetes mellitus? And the age of, when why was it called juvenile diabetes previously? Well, typically around the average age where people start to or are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus or show symptoms of diabetes mellitus is less than 20 years. So they say, okay, this is kind of a young person's disease. That's what they thought before, but this is possible to develop type 1 diabetes mellitus later on in life. It's uncommon, but it's still possible. So that's why juvenile diabetes is not really the preferred term. And this is what makes it, defines type 1 diabetes mellitus, is that these people need insulin. They are insulin dependent. So why are they insulin dependent? Well, it's because their body doesn't produce enough insulin, therefore they need to supplement their body with insulin so that they have normal blood glucose levels throughout their life. And it's relatively rare. So this is another big difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. If you have, someone says diabetes, they have diabetes, they're probably saying that they have type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is like, remember that we have like 34 million-ish Americans living with type with a, any, any sort of type diabetes mellitus. And look at this, like only like maybe one and a half million Americans are living with type 2, 1 diabetes mellitus. So 
they're they're there and there's still a lot of people but not far from the majority of people with diabetes mellitus and this is one of those people right and i have to keep it <laughs> yeah so, so so it's like, right? one of the Jonas Brothers, right? It was Nick, right? Okay, I always have to remember myself. I'm not. This is like not my generation, but yeah, I know he's like he he's one of the more famous like type of people who have type one diabetes mellitus. So, was it insulin and blood glucose? So, what happens in type one diabetes mellitus? Well, remember that they are insulin dependent, right? So your body normally makes insulin when you have blood glucose and it needs to feed your cells or bring your blood glucose levels down. Now, when insulin binds to its receptor, what is it going to do? It's going to, again, cause glucose transporters to appear on your cells, thereby moving glucose out of your bloodstream and feeding your cells. Now, with type 1 diabetes, something happens to this process. Well, people who are t have type 1 diabetes, mellitus, they're not going to produce enough insulin. So if you don't have insulin, then can you activate these receptors? Not really, right? So if you can't activate these receptors, these those glucose transport vesicles, they don't appear, or not glucose transport, yeah, those vesicles containing glucose transporters, they're not going to appear on the surface. So you can't move this glucose from your bloodstream into your cells. So if these glucose transporters aren't appearing on your cells, then what happens to the glucose? The glucose stays in your bloodstream. So if glucose keeps on getting released into your bloodstream, but there's no way to get it out of your bloodstream and into your cells, what happens is that the glucose builds up and up and up and up, and then you have more and more glucose concentration, then you have hyperglycemia. So hyperglycemia, again, for this class, we're going to define it as over greater than 110 mg per deciliter. And then again, our symptoms are polydipsia because you're losing a lot of fluid, you're, you're to, through urination and if you're losing a lot of fluid you're going to be increased in your you're, you're going to have increased thirst because you want to replace those lost fl fluids yeah and also polyuria urea due to having more glucose in your blood and remember due to osmolarity if you have a very sugary solution and a more dilute solution the water is going to leave that dilute solution solution and go to the sugary solution if that sugary solution is your blood, that's going to bring more volume into your blood, going to bring more volume into your kidneys, going to bring more volume into your urine. So this is kind of like building on each other. And also increased hunger. So that's also going to affect trigger mechanisms in the brain to say, oh, I'm kind of hungry. Maybe I'm not getting enough of this stuff. Blurred vision. So many things occur with hyperglycemia and unexplained weight loss. So it, type 1 diabetes mellitus, this is why people who have this, sometimes they might be on the leaner side because this is a common symptom of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Ketoacidosis, maybe we'll get more into the detail when we talk about metabolism later on this semester, but yeah, many symptoms occurring with type uncontrolled type 1 diabetes mellitus. Now, here we have the blood glucose and what is here? what cells produce insulin? Remember, our beta cells produce insulin, right? So you have our beta cells, and here we have our cells with insulin receptor. So what should normally happen is, again, beta cells are producing insulin, and insulin binds to the receptor, and then transporters appear on the surface, thereby moving glucose from your blood into your cells and lowering your blood glucose. But what happens in type 1 diabetes, a common thing is that the people with type 1 diabetes, they have autoantibodies that attack the B cells. So basically, their immune system is attacking their pancreatic beta cells. If these autoantibodies are attacking their beta cells and causing them to die or be less functional, then what's going to happen to your body's supply of insulin? Well, without beta cells or having a lack of beta cells, you're going to have a lack of insulin. If you have a lack of insulin, then are you going to have insulin receptor activity? Nope, you're going to have no little insulin receptor activity because now you don't have as much insulin as normal. If you don't have the insulin receptor signaling, then you won't have those glucose transporters. So what happens? Well, say this person eats a meal, but they don't have any, they don't have functional beta cells. Glucose is entering their bloodstream, but without the ability to activate these insulin receptors and have the glucose transporters appear, this glucose stays in the bloodstream. They eat another meal, more glucose, but is there glucose transporters? Nope, because we took insulin out of the equation. 
So every time they eat or <laughs> release additional glucose into their bloodstream, they're not going to feed their cells. So this is another reason why we have that hunger because the cells aren't getting fed. Even though there's glucose appearing in the bloodstream, because it's not efficiently entering the cells, this is triggering all sorts of things that in the body that says like, hey, am I actually getting the nutrients? I need glucose. Where's that glucose? Yeah, it's there, but it's not being transported. It's kind of like the supply chain is disrupted. All right. Yeah, so if they have blood sugar fridge, yeah, so this is like, ooh, so someone says like, I know someone and he's blood, low blood sugar and has to eat sugar frequently. Why is that? And I'll get to that real quick. All right, so how do you treat that? Well, if they're not making enough insulin, what can you, how can you treat it? Well, you can give them recombinant insulin injections. And why do you say recombinant? Because they used to, like, I think even, even before, like the, like maybe how many decades ago, maybe around like, maybe around the 70s and 80s, like before then, they would be, have to actually take animal pancreases, purify the insulin, and then people would have to inject this animal insulin into their body. But now they're actually able to take the human gene for insulin, put into bacteria, and then bacteria can make this protein. They, they're not going to inject the, inject the bacteria itself. They're going to take the insulin that's made by this bacteria, purify it so there's none of that bacteria junk in it. So you just have pure insulin, and this is what we have with these recombinant insulin injections and insulin pumps so sometimes like now they have all these sophisticated ones that can detect someone's blood glucose and give an appropriate amount of insulin say someone accidentally injects too much and kind of overshoot things and they inject too much insulin well remember that insulin lowers blood sugar right so that person who that person's friend who has um type 1 diabetes mellitus maybe if their body is cranking out too much or they inject too much insulin that could lower their blood sugar a little too low so they kind of overshoot that blood sugar and then they kind of overestimate it and then they end up in that kind of low like, hypoglycemic range. So this is why these people who have diabetes mellitus, it's important for them to monitor their blood sugar. But these insulin pumps, I mean, this might be an old one. They're always like coming out with new models and there's some that can that like they have, you might see somebody in public wearing one of those like monitors that monitor blood sugar. And it might be sending Bluetooth signals to this pump that releases so like varying amounts of insulin depending on how much, like what, that, what, how high or low their blood sugar is. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and yeah, this is why I like Nick because he's very open about his type one diabetes mellitus and has brought a lot of awareness to this, like insulin pump saying, yeah, it's not something to be ashamed of. It's like something, yeah, it's part of. What they he has to live with and this is why it's really cool that they have all this like awareness for type 1 diabetes okay so one way you can do that is just have some way of delivering because these people with type 1 diabetes mellitus they lack insulin then you're going to inject insulin somehow so you ins introduce insulin back into their body the insulin can bind to the receptors so if say they just ate a very sugary meal or carb rich meal and what they can do is have an insulin dose depending on like their blood glucose and then this when they inject the insulin it activates the insulin receptors causing the glucose transporters to appear at the cell surface and now they can lower their blood sugar back to normal levels so that they don't develop hyperglycemia from having a lack of insulin receptor signaling Yeah, so weight loss occurred because, and that's the interesting thing. Yeah, maybe we, it's it's actually pretty. That might be a good question because yeah, with weight loss and type one diabetes mellitus, it's like okay, where is the body going to get nutrients from? Is it if your glucose isn't available, how will the body get its nutrients and keep itself alive? Especially your brain. Your brain all consumes so much of your or not or significant portion of your calories. Like compared to its actual weight, it consumes more calories than propor it's a proportional weight to the body. So yeah, you, you, your body is going to try, if it has a lack of glucose and the glucose isn't getting to your cells, it's going to try to find ways to get energy somehow because it's got to keep itself alive. That's the general answer, but if we have me metabolism, maybe if we can get time, but yeah, I never have time to c cover that in the me metabolism chapter. All right.
that aside, let's talk about type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this is the more common one. Like type 1 is important, but it's not the major far from the majority of the cases. So most people with type 2 diabetes mellitus still produce insulin, but something isn't happening like as normal. So what characterizes uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus versus type 1 where you have a lack of insulin? Type people with type 2 diabetes mellitus have something called insulin resistance. So what happens is that you can have insulin there, and it could be normal levels of insulin. But with people who have insulin resistance, their cells don't respond normally to insulin. So too much insulin, so the, the funny thing is that the body is like, okay, wait, I want to move sugar into the, my cells, but it's not happening. I'm producing insulin. Maybe I'm not producing enough insulin. So the body is going to say, okay, I'm not feeding my cells. I'm, my blood sugar is too high. I'm going to crank out more insulin. And this thing is that this insulin, even though you're cranking out more, your body is cranking out more insulin, it's not being respond. Your, the rest of the body and cells are not responding to that extra insulin. So this is one big difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Type 1 diabetes mellitus, you have a lack of insulin. But type 2 diabetes mellitus, you typically see too much insulin in the blood. So this condition is called hyperinsulinemia because why the body says like, okay, insulin is not working correct. Maybe I'm not producing enough. Let's produce more insulin. So how do cells become insulin resistant? So why causes a cell to no longer respond to insulin? Well, thing is that there's a process called generally called desensitization. So what happens is like, okay, insulin is there, but what happens if you keep activating these processes over and over again? Or this work this is one way this can happen. Sometimes like when the body has like too high state of a, like if you keep on activating these receptors over and over again, the body might be saying, okay, wait, we shouldn't have this high level of activity all the time. Maybe let's dial down the signal a bit. So it's like the body's like, the cells might be like, okay, I'm kind of tired of like this. I'm always being bombarded by this insulin signaling. Maybe I'm going to dial this down. So the desensitization, there's multiple ways this can happen. Sometimes the body ends up, or cells can actually block or remove some of these receptors from the surface. So if there's no receptors, then, or fewer receptors on the surface of these cells, well, you can still have the same levels of insulin, but you're not going to get as much signaling and you're not going to have as much glucose transport because there are fewer receptors on the cells in the body. So that's one way of desensitizing. It's not the only way, but this is one way. So compared to our previous example where pretty much every cell had a glucose transporter in our previous example, we have fewer cells with glucose transporters, meaning that these the body is going to accumulate glucose and over time. So that's one thing the two types of diabetes mellitus have in common. They have hyperglycemia in common because the body is not getting enough insulin signaling. And but again, remember that the body's like, wait, I want to my blood sugar is too high, my cells aren't getting fed. Hey, maybe I'm not producing more insulin. So this is what is the bot beta cells are going to secrete more insulin. And, but remember that in this example of desensitization, we have fewer cells actually transporting glucose out of the bloodstream. So we have less cells to do even heavier lifting. So sugar builds up, the body's gonna say, hey, our blood sugar is too high, let's make more insulin. So it's kind of like this bit, uh, snowballs out of control. More sugar really leading to more insulin and less, and then not enough insulin signaling leading to the accumulation of more sugar, leading to more insulin. So type 2 diabetes typically has both above, you know, like abnormally high sugar and abnormally high insulin. Compared to type 1 diabetes, if there is uncontrolled type 1 diabetes, they have high hyperglycemia but a lack of insulin. Okay, so people with type two, early type 2 diabetes still produce insulin, but things is that your body, like especially with chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes mellitus, they might, that might, their insulin production might drop off eventually. So insulin resistance is this negative feedback due to chronic, so actually there's many ways that you can develop insulin resistance. I just talked about one of them. 
But the thing is that it's also affected by other nutrients in the body as well. So free fatty acids and lipids, they can also cause insulin resistance. So this is also a diet. So there's a so potential dietary causes as well. So it's characterized by something affecting the insulin receptors. Maybe there will be fewer insulin receptors on the surface of the cells, or remember all those insulin, like the, those things that occur in the cell when the insulin binds to its receptor? It can also be affected by having, a, by having chronic hyperinsulinemia or too many fatty acids. So again, this definition of hyperinsulinemia meaning too much um, insulin in the body. Now, desensitization, so again, this can ha you can have fewer receptors, but another thing can happen as well. So what I just showed here, normal insulin signaling, insulin binding to its receptors, glucotransport is appearing on the surface. But what can happen is that your cells, like if they have like some sort of rate, like too high insulin or too much insulin receptor activity, or if they have like too much free fatty acids, they can actually block these signalings inside the cell. So if you block these signals inside the cell, then you won't have the transport of glucose that transporters toward the surface. They stay inside the cell. Therefore, you don't have glucose being moved from the bloodstream into cells. So glucose accumulates, but because the insulin receptor isn't responding normally, you don't have the movement of these glucose transporters up here. Therefore, glucose stay, accumulates, and now we have hyperglycemia again. Now this is the reason why, so now I don't expect you to know this at this level, because, but this is more like, maybe this is a little advanced even for med school, but what we have here is a free fatty acid, and somehow this, like, or not somehow, but this free fatty acid signaling, and it also has its own receptors and transporters, and free fatty acids can actually block insulin signaling. So but what we're seeing with all this like alphabet soup here, are all these enzymes and this is what I mean by signal transduction and why I'm representing it by those yellow cartoons earlier because I don't want you to worry about all of this here but what I want you to appreciate is that sometimes insulin receptors can be shut off by other factors occurring outside of the cell or within the cell itself. All right so with type 2 diabetes and desensitization is that sometimes not so one way was like having fewer receptors but sometimes these receptors can be turned off. They might be there at the surface, but something like a, too much hyperlipidemia or other factors might turn off these receptors even though they're present. So you still have insulin, you still have insulin receptors, but something is turning this whole signaling off. Just kind of like disconnecting the wiring or something, messing up with the wiring of the cell and responding to the sensor. So with fewer receptors that are functional, you're going to have fewer glucose transporters on the cell surface. Therefore, you're going to have less transport of and removal, a slower rate of moving glucose from the bloodstream into cells. So if this whole process slows down, what can happen? Well, again, the body's gonna say like, hey, the glucose isn't entering my cells fast enough. Let's throw more insulin in the, the equation. But with the receptors not really working and having inefficient movement of glucose into the cells, this glucose is going to uh, accumulate in the bloodstream and insulin is also going to accumulate as well. All right, so let's put this all together. What would your body normally secrete in response to high blood glucose levels? So all those cartoons, why did I show it over and over again? Well, what would your body normally do to bring gl gl blood glucose levels back to normal? Okay, so the hormone we're talking about is what we've been talking about for the past dozen or so slides, right? So insulin is going to lower blood glucose by causing those glucose transporters to appear on the surface of cells, thereby moving glucose from the bloodstream into cells. Next question. So what would your body normally secrete in response to low blood glucose levels? Okay, most of you said glucagon and most of you are correct. So again, glucagon is the one that works opposite of insulin and even though we didn't talk about the other ones we have here in detail, 
Yeah, glucagon and insulin, they generally work in opposing fashions. Insulin lowers blood glucose, glucagon increases blood glucose. Okay, is it possible to have both type 1 and type 2 diabetes? So is type 1, are type 1 and type 2 diabetes mutually exclusive, meaning that you can only have one or the other? Or is the, are there special cases where you can have both type 1 and type 2 diabetes at the same time? Okay, let's see what people said. So let's see, majority of you said no. And actually it is possible in rare instances to have type 1 and type 2 diabetes at the same time. I'll explain why. Okay, so going on. So type 1 and type 2 diabetes, remember that type 1 is resulting from an insulin deficiency due to something affecting the beta cells production of insulin. So insulin is out of the equation. But with type 2 diabetes, what do you have? You have insulin resistance due to a lack of receptors or something affecting the activity of receptors. So instead of having a lack of insulin, you have a lack insulin resistance. You just have something affecting the, affecting the receptors. So remember, type 1 is going to affect the insulin, the levels of horm insulin hormone itself. Type 2 affects the receptors. So is it possible to have a lack of insulin and something affecting the receptors as well? And it is possible, but they both end up resulting in the same thing, right? A lack of insulin or glucose transporters appearing on the cell surface. So in rare cases, you can have type 1 ty and type 2 diabetes occurring in the same person. So again, type 1 referring to that lack of insulin, type 2 rever referring to insulin resistance due to something happening to the receptors for insulin. So type 1 and 2, when people have that, both of them at the same time, they're not producing enough insulin and their cells have something wrong with their insulin receptors. So this is why it's possible to have type 1 and type 2 diabetes at the same time. Now, in this case, can you still treat with insulin alone? Well, you could add insulin to address the type 1 problem, but if the cells aren't responding to insulin normally, it might not be the best case of the route of action. And one thing you can do is, like for type 2 diabetes, is use some pharmaceutical agents. A classic one is metformin or glucophage, that's a trade name. Now what is it going to do? It's going to inhibit gluconeogenesis. So what it, remember that gluconeogenesis is the production of new glucose, thereby increasing your blood glucose levels. So by inhibiting the creation of new glucose, that's going to prevent the accumulation of glucose and lower blood glucose as well. But it also increases insulin sensitivity. So all those like mechanisms like having fewer receptors for insulin or turning off those receptors, metformin tries to reverse it. So it's a first line choice, meaning that often like this is the first thing a doctor or a pharmacist might prescribe for type 2 diabetes mellitus. But this is, is a cure-all. Well, it also causes a lot of GI effects, especially nausea, GI irritation. So they, like using the bathroom and like, uh, <laughs> like diarrhea is also a common complaint as well or bloating, so this has also, so it's really great if it does work, but it's if the patient tolerates it enough. So what is metformin going to need to do? Say you have those mechanisms where the intracellular enzymes uh, that are downstream of insulin binding to its receptor, say that is turned off. Well, what metformin can do is restore the sensitivity, because right now we have insulin resistance, but metformin is a sensitizer so it's going to cause these cells to instead of being resistant become more sensitive so that we can restore the signaling of insulin and insulin receptor bringing glucose transporters back to the surface so we can restore blood sugar homeostasis and lower this patient's blood sugar back to normal levels now type 2 diabetes why is it so there are many risk factors and as we age we have an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes mellitus so this is what another reason why they previously called type 1 diabetes juvenile diabetes because the average age where the symptoms of type 2 diabetes started to appear is generally older as we see with this increased risk with age 
genetics also plays a role too and this is why I asked that question at the beginning because family history if you have a parent with type 1 di or not type 1 or actually diabetes mellitus you have an increased risk of developing diabetes yourself now does that mean if both parents have diabetes mellitus you're guaranteed to have diabetes mellitus that's not guaranteed but it also says like okay you should watch out for the risk factors that make it and especially like one big part of diabetes mellitus is lifestyle so you want to make sure that you're not pushing yourself toward this type 2 diabetes early on and even like your genetic background or where your ancestry is from so these ethnic groups have a high increased risk than or average than of having type 2 diabetes and yeah so you see all of this is affects different populations and different people from different ancestries in the different odds risks and then also cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease, having something wrong with your heart or some heart disease, can not, or also your vasculature as well, so having high blood pressure, that can also predispose you to hyper type 2 diabetes mellitus. Sedentary lifestyle, so if you're not active, you don't do a lot of exercise, that's it. And genetics, yeah, so how does this affect? Now this is the thing, so this is just based on the statistics they get what the genes are sometimes they actually look at the population and they pull up like a dozen genes so this is why it gets kind of tricky because it's like okay, these like they do something called genome-wide association studies and it's really hard to pinpoint because you see all the alphabet soup with all those enzymes earlier sometimes like it's not just one enzyme being affected it might be multiple enzymes and sometimes like in different populations you might have different variations of enzymes as well so this is why diabetes research is very complicated because of all those signaling pathways we saw earlier, different, there are so many varieties of that out in our global population. But one big factor is obesity. So let's try to cover obesity real quick. And I know some people are going to, when I talk about this, so this is a CDC and WHO definition and also the NIH definition. So it involves body mass index. And I know some people are like, I can hear some people bristling about body mass index, and yes, I know, I know. But this is their definition. Obesity is the body mass index greater than 30 or, 30 or greater. So what is body mass index? Well, if you take a nutrition class, you probably know this, or if you're a KRS major, you probably know this as well. So it's the weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters square. Or if you really like the imperial system and you like pounds in height, you have to multiply by this factor of 703. I prefer kilograms or meters because you don't have that factor. Now, again, this is our BMI. So what we have here is like a little cartoon showing someone. Uh, so I like this. It's kind of like those TSA images. But what we have here is like a normal BMI by the CDC and WHO definitions is less than 25 using this formula. So if you have an individual who's five foot nine. This is less than 168 pounds if you're using those imperial units we use here in the United States. All right, so overweight would be between 25 and 30. So this would be in a five foot nine individual between 160 and 202 pounds. And obese would be considered 30 or above. So that means in someone who's fat, same height as our previous examples, this would be somebody who's over 202 pounds. Now, why does BMI, like why do people measure BMI and why do they use this in studies? Well, BMI, high, having a high BMI is associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, that means high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and short life expectancy. So the higher your BMI is above normal, then you have an increased risk of all of these. Doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have this, but all of these I listed here are associated with higher BMI. Now, yes, I know, I know some people are like bristling about BMI and mentioning that, but this, there are criticisms of BMI and they're very valid. It doesn't take into consider like definitely differences between sex, but also like differences between body composition. So bone, muscle, and fat. Here we have like, I'm trying to find the original, original post, but it might have been deleted. But here we have the same guy and what we see, and the WWR, don't worry about this class, this, I think this example is showing his 
uh, weight to or waist and weight ratio and we see it's like similar but he's like super diced and lean this one but this is where it's interesting so in this picture he's like bulked up he's got some muscle you put on some mass and over here we see that he's a little leaner and notice that his BMI is pretty similar like he maybe went down maybe around a little more than half a point but what we see is that yeah he is like leaner he definitely put on mass compared to before and especially if you compare this like he has a BMI of almost 30 which would be considered obese and over here he's considered obese because he has a BMI over 30. Does he look like a, what we typically associate with like obesity? So it also doesn't count for the genetic differences in body composition so if you look at that, the NIH's definitions of obesity and how it's related to type 2 diabetes mellitus risk, there's different groups that have different cutoffs for when you say, oh, they might have an increased risk of diabetes mellitus. So the thing is that obesity does not guarantee that you will develop diabetes mellitus or other metabolic disorders, nor are people with the normal weight or with normal BMI completely safe from metabolic disease. So these are two big criticisms of BMI. So why study BMI at all? Like BMI is not perfect. It's definitely far from perfect. But this is why BMI is still measured and why it's used in statistics because one, it's non-invasive. You don't need a blood test. And also it's easily measured because all you need is a scale and you just need a ruler, right? You need something to get height and weight, very simple. And it's also compared to something like bot, and you don't need to like jump into a tank of water or have like calipers, which is also like, also depending on who's doing the measurement, like if you're using body fat calipers, if whether someone has like a really death grip and they can grab a lot of fat or if they have weak grip, that can affect your results as well. So it's also relatively consistent and also more historical data available like even measuring body fat has like different technologies and techniques have evolved over time so body fat composition measures measurements now might not be comparable to body fat composition of uh, measurements maybe like several decades ago so this is why bmi like we have a lot of historical data on height and weight and it's still useful more on the epidemiological level. So the thing about BMI is like, should it be, it shouldn't, it should definitely not be the only thing you look at when determining what's a healthy weight or looking at just the health of a person. So on an individual level, BMI is not that useful just by itself. It's, but it's more of like a screening tool to say like, okay, maybe this person, one has a family history of diabetes mellitus or they're in a risk, the group that typically historically has a higher percentage of people on average that have diabetes mellitus, maybe we'll do some blood work to see, okay, do they have normal levels of blood glucose? What do their lipids profiles look like? So other things like that as well. But for BMI, it's useful for tracking trends. So I'm going to end with this part right here. So this is back in 1985 where we're studying and the parts in gray, we don't see any data yet. But what we see here is that for the states, we do have BMI data from 1985, way before like a lot of you were born. We see that there are some states that have less than 10 people, percent of people that have obese BMI, and then 10 to 15 percent, that's the most we saw in this cohort. Now in 1988, let's go a little more. Now we're trying to fill out the United States, and we're still missing data from like Nevada, Wyoming, and Kansas, but we see that, ooh, now we have a new category. Now the max. Now we have some states that have between 15 to 20 percent of people having obese BMI, and then we go. Now we have all states in play right here. So we have 1994, and then notice that 1994 we actually had no states have um, like less than 10 percent of the population having obese BMIs. Now in 1997, we see a new category. We see that some of these states, like was it Kentucky and Indiana and Mississippi, now they're entering the 20, 25% of their population having, being, having obese BMIs. And then over here, like, oh, it looks like Colorado is the only holdout for that 10 to 15%. And now we have a new category. So now we have Indiana, West Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, 
now having a new category between 20 or I should say 25 percent to 30 percent obese in their population and then in 2006 another category being added so Mississippi and West Virginia pushing the border into the 30 to 35 percent category and the Colorado still hanging on there and then Colorado still hanging on strong but now like oh we have more states joining that 30 to 35 percent obese population and then it spreads on and yeah Colorado fell in this one so now we have like fifth there's no longer any states that have less than 20 percent of their population obese and now they're starting to include the territory so we, now we have Puerto Rico we have Guam we have DC but yeah we see that we don't have any states that have fewer than or less than 20 percent of their population obese and then we go on and on and then 2013 now we finally have some states that broke the 35% obese mark. So that means more than one out of three people in these states have an obese BMI. And then over here, so in 2014, we have like this red starting to spread throughout the different states. And yeah, oh, Colorado and Hawaii, where at least we're like the only holds out, holdouts in that 20 to 25% range. And then 2019, we see more and more red. And this is like, so this is, uh, I always like to update this every year. And oh, no. Oh yeah, Hawaii, I guess, flipped from green to yellow in 2019. And then now we're, at, this is where we were last year. So we're seeing more and more states getting red. And do you think it's like that previous example where that everyone saw all of a sudden joining gyms and becoming bodybuilders and having increased muscle and bone composition. So again, even though obesity and BMI shouldn't be used by itself on the individual basis, we do see this increased trend in increased body mass index. And what do we think is causing that? Well, that's a complex question. And, but we do see that we have this problem with having too much weight in our, our bodies and due to this increased obesity we see spreading across the United States. And if you look at the CDC's data on obesity from 2020, if you look at this chart right here, you notice that they have a category that's greater than 40%, so more than four out of 10 people having obese BMIs. Luckily in 2020, they don't have any states like that yet. But there are some people who are some states that are rapidly approaching this. So again, is it due to people getting more like muscle and bone or is it due to people getting more adipose? So we'll save that for next week. So we're talking about adipose and how it's related to not just like about diabetes mellitus, but adipose itself also has its endocrine effect.